So we're going to be welcoming Phil Driver very shortly to talk about a framing strategy when emerging from a crisis. We're delighted that you are joining us today. So first of all, a couple of questions. You can see a fairly, uh, a fairly broad range. Um, Phil, you'll be interested to see you've got a good number of fellow engineers. And this led segment in industry strategy in large, large scale public sector strategies. And, and goodness me, uh, I can't think of a bigger, um, a, a more larger scale strategy than the one we're staring down the barrel of today. Um, I, I first was introduced to Phil, I, I guess around 10 years ago, when I had the pleasure of working with him to publish his book, uh, his first book called Validating Strategies. And at the time, we have a holy grail connection between projects, outputs, outcome, all that today. Um, and I think you'll get a sense of that from this webinar. So Phil, uh, over to you. So Jonathan, you know, thanks for your, your kind introduction and hello everybody. I hope you're all coping okay with the COVID-19 lockdown. It's certainly an opportunity to learn about all the different ways we and others respond to a crisis. Today, I want to cover two main areas. One is the post-crisis strategic context. What is this environment we're going into? What are the characteristics of that environment and how are they going to affect us as in the project management arena? And then I'll talk through how Open Strategies addresses the challenges that we're going to be facing. So let's start by looking at the context of uh, complex strategies. So I'm going to quickly give you some definitions of strategic planning strategy project management, the scale of what we're talking about. I'm going to look at the concept of society reset. I'm going to discuss what I mean by this, do things with us, not for, to or at us. I want to compare the different experiences people have of crises and therefore their different expectations of the post-crisis environment. And I want to touch on this thing called human cognitive limits. So let's start with just a couple of definitions. I want to use this definition for strategic planning. These are the things that go on under strategic planning, if you just skim through that. So strategic planning has a whole lot of activities trying to understand what we're going to do, but the end point of strategic planning needs to be a strategy. And this is the definition I use for strategy, do the right things or Professor Vermeulen at London Business School, an action plan and a rationale. What are we going to do and why? So the strategy is the things we're going to do. It's not all of that stuff up there in strategic planning. So an effective strategy needs to focus on what we're actually going to do and why we're going to do it. And then following on from that, we get into project management, do things right. And I shouldn't need to explain project management to this forum. So I've got one question here for you. Of all the projects you've been involved in, what percentage do you believe were the right projects for you to be involved in? Move. You can see we divide this up into five sections, uh, 0 to 20, up there through to 80 to 100. There, there's ab above projects where people feel it wasn't quite the right project. If they'd had a chance to get involved in strategy, they would have changed the project some way. So yeah, distribution like that is about what I would expect strategies, regional, local strategies will have multiple themes, diverse perspective, hundreds and hundreds of stakeholders. And all of that happens simultaneously. So that's the type of strategy that I want to talk about, not just a strategy on how you're going to build a car. It's strategies to respond to large scale crises, and they've got some pretty serious characteristics. I'm going to show you a photo that I took um, about two weeks ago in my garden. All I want you to do is to say, what's your reaction to that photo? The issue here is it's autumn down here in New Zealand. So what's that blossom doing there? Blossom and an apple at the same time. This to me is an example of the reset we need to go through after an emergency or after a crisis. Things are different, things are unexpected. I don't understand this photo. How can you have blossom in autumn when you've got an apple? I don't know what caused that to happen. I don't know if the blossom will set fruit over winter. Am I going to get new blossom in spring? I don't know, maybe other people know. I'm certainly going to ask around, but maybe nobody knows. 
maybe you need to collect more information, conduct experiments and learn, learn, learn. Crises do things like this. They remove certainty. We used to have the certainty that apples were autumn, blossom was springtime. And here we've got an image from two weeks ago here. Something has changed. So a post-crisis strategic environment is full of unknown unknowns. We don't know what's going on here. And so we have to be inquisitive. We have to ask questions. We, and it's really important that we don't leap in with answers. Because what we're finding with this crisis is all over the world, people are leaping in and giving answers. And we need to be mindful of a statement by the American philosopher H.L. Mencken. And he said, for every problem, there is a solution that is plausible, obvious, and wrong. We need to prepare ourselves for complete new thinking. Crises remove certainty. They remove what we thought was always true, in this case, about an apple and blossom. So already this concept of a society reset, climate change is resetting nature and us. The pandemic will reset society. Less emphasis on economics, perhaps. More emphasis on social, environmental, cultural well-being. Certainly more emphasis on frontline staff and personal protection equipment. And things are changing incredibly fast. So we're in a, an environment of unknown unknowns. And our mindset has to lock into that unknown unknowns. We've got to put our historical certainties to one side and be open to change, open to new ideas. So that's really crucial. The next point I want to raise in a large multi-stakeholder strategic environment is this concept of do things with us, not for, to, or at us. So a post-crisis world is incredibly complex. Think of, po of COVID, post-financial um, crisis, post-earthquake. Nobody can understand it all. Absolutely nobody can understand it all. It is too big. So we need to have hundreds of strategies all over the world, all working together, if we're going to achieve a healthy outcome. So we have to do what we call liberate collective wisdom. We have to liberate the wisdom of everybody who's affected, everybody who can contribute. And I deliberately use the word liberate collective wisdom, not try and control it, because in COVID-19, you cannot control all the different stakeholders. We have to liberate their wisdom and find ways of bringing it together. It's a very messy, complex environment. What I call the powers that be, they cannot be heroes. They can't save us. They can do good things like buy more PPE equipment. They can put some rules and regulations out there. But at the end of the day, everybody needs to save us. We need to save ourselves right across the world. And I think our New Zealand Prime Minister captures this really well with the following statements. Jacinda has done several things well, I believe, over here. She's been open to wisdom from all reputable sources. The Minister of Health has been absolutely superb in giving us the information we need. She has then given us very clear guidance based on that wisdom. These are the things we need to do. She creates meaning for New Zealanders by telling us why we're doing it. We're doing it for each other. And she really expresses empathy and em uh, emphasizes kindness. Those last few words, I think, capture things really well. You did it for each other. We're not doing it for the prime minister. We're not doing it for government. When we're trying to operate in a post-crisis environment, we are doing things for each other. Let's look at the individual experience of crises and, and how different they can be. So people have diverse experiences of a crisis, and that means they have diverse expectations post-crisis. And that means there is no single list of priorities. It might be a list of priorities for a local authority, but they won't be the same as the priorities for the hospital. They won't be the same as the priorities for the sports club. So when you're doing strategies in these large complex environments, you have to move away from this idea of there being a single set of priorities because there aren't. A single set of priorities simply doesn't work in a complex environment. 
I'll just run through a few examples after the Canterbury earthquakes of different experiences. During the earthquakes, uh, we had a lot of liquefaction. Now, liquefaction is where the, during the earthquake, the ground liquefies, and so the sand and soil goes all runny and it flows up under the foundations of houses. So after the earthquakes, I and many other people volunteered to get this liquefaction out from underneath the houses. So I was working away there, pulling this dirt and mud out from under a house, and another guy turned up to help me. And I just asked him casually, how did you get on in the earthquake? And he said, I lost my house. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I've got nowhere else to go, so I might as well help other people. So that was one man's experience of the crisis. A couple of days later, I was in a supermarket over in the western suburbs of Christchurch. And the western suburbs were not badly affected. The eastern suburbs lost their supermarkets, they lost their doctors, they had no water and no electricity. The western suburbs had all of those things. And there was a woman in the supermarket and she was saying she didn't like the eastern suburbs people shopping in her supermarket because they smelled. That was her experience of a crisis. I almost thought it was funny. But then I realized that for her, that was a genuine trauma for her. And it's this divergence of, of experience that we really have to get our head around in a post-crisis environment. I live here out in the country on one and a half acres of land. And during the shutdown period, it's fantastic because the roads are quiet, I can do cycling trips, I can spend time in the garden. My experience of the lockdown is wonderful. I know other people where there's a single mum with three kids stuck in an apartment. Her experience is different and what she wants after the earthquake is different. So, okay, so we've touched on the difference, diff people's different views of crises and post-crises. I want to touch on this issue of human cognitive limits because if we're going to be working with a lot of people, we have to understand how much can people get their heads around? Miller's law has been around a long time. People can hold seven plus or minus two concepts in their heads. And that seems to be proven over and over again. It might be a wee bit op optimistic. Possibly as project managers, we can deal with 10 plus or minus five. But on average, people can hold that many ideas in their heads. How about in a diagram? If, or if you're given people printed information, have a look at these two diagrams. We believe people could look at that diagram on the left and with a little bit of training, they could understand it. Look at the diagram on the right. And for most people, it's TLDR, too long, didn't read. So as a project manager, you might understand the diagram like that one on the right. It might be your pet diagram. But if you put that out in the public when you're trying to get hundreds of stakeholders to do something, they simply won't get it. And that leads to what I call driver's law. Most people can comprehend just 15 plus or minus five concepts in a well-designed diagram. So if we're going to do large-scale multi-stakeholder strategies, the way we present the information has to be exquisitely simple. There are other aspects of human cognitive limits in the strategic environment. We focus on the smallest amount of strategic information that has the highest value to the most people, and I underline those three key words. That's our mantra for our company. So let's look at that. I found all of these words in a single government strategy document. And this word came up once. Now, if you look at all those words, we can recognize them all, can't we? We've seen words like competition values, accountabilities, directions, issues, factors. We all know what they mean. So I'm going to ask you a question. Which of these statements is true? Do goals contribute to objectives? B, do objectives contribute to goals? Or objectives and goals the same thing? Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. Yes, okay, it's all the same thing. I don't agree. What about all those other ways out into the big wide world and we're trying to deal? So when we developed our open strategy system, we couldn't agree on whether goals contribute to objectives or objectives contribute to goals. So we, we create a different language and I'll come on to that in just a minute. A couple more slides I wanna go through before I get into the solution to this complexity. And that is this idea of complexity. The strategic environment post-crisis is complex. It's full of 
what are known as unknowns, unknowns. We just don't know. I don't know, you don't know. We have to go and find out. However, a strategy has to be simple actions. A strategy can only have known knowns. You can only implement what you know you're going to implement. You can't implement something unknown. The consequence of what you do, the consequence of your known action might be uncertain. But your strategy has to be simple. It cannot be a complex strategy, even though the environment is complex. So how do we translate from a complex strategic environment through to simple actions? So I'll take you how, through how we do this. The first question is, what should a strategy do? And I believe strategy should guide improvements in what organisations actually do. So I'm going to ask what is, appears to be a trivial question. What do organisations actually do? So does that make sense? Organisations, whether they're public sector or private sector or third sector, they create assets, they create products, services or infrastructure. And they enable and motivate people to use those assets to create benefits. That we believe is the universal description of what organisations do. And I'm going to show how we represent that in our system. And here's this magic thing that we call PRUB, Projects, Results, Uses and Benefits. So along the bottom, we see that um, description of what organisations do, create assets that enable and motivate people to use the assets to create benefits. But if I use that sentence in a public forum, people's eyes glaze over, they don't get it. It's too complex. What are assets? We find that the words projects, results, uses and benefits are four words that people understand. They understand them widely. So instead of using that sentence at the bottom, we use that sequence prub. So projects create assets or results. The users use the, those assets to generate benefits. And I'm going to give you some real examples shortly. A key point here is it's only the use of the asset that creates the benefit. So the project doesn't create the benefit, the result doesn't create the benefit. The use of the asset creates the benefits. Usually organizations run projects and results and usually people in the community, whether it's customers or the community, undertake the uses and benefits. So there's a change of ownership from the left to the right. Most uses are voluntary. You cannot force people to do something. So we, the result needs to be handed over to the users. So it's got to be the right result or, or the use won't happen. How, how do we get to the right result? Well, first of all, we have to listen to the users. What do they want to do? What benefits do they want? So understand uses and benefits by engaging with the users. That will tell you what results you need to undertake and therefore what projects you need to undertake. We haven't yet found any strategy that didn't fit these four words, project, result, use, benefit. And just as an aside, implementation goes from left to right. You run projects, produce results, create uses, Oh, sorry, enable users to create benefits. Strategic thinking should work the other way. It should burp, B-U-R-P. Understand the benefits and the uses first, and that will define your results and projects. Let's just look at two really simple examples of the sequence, and these are deliberately simplistic. So here's two examples. The first one is what we call a substrategy on sustainably manufacturing product. And the second one is about building a cycleway. So just have a quick look through those. So Hopefully you can see in each of these cases that the results, although they're good things, they're not benefits. The company's got products available. That's not a benefit, it's just the products are available. The cycleway in the second example, as a result, it's sitting there. It's a white elephant if it isn't used. 
So in both these cases, it's the uses that create the benefit. The use of the company's product, buying the company product, creates the benefit of happy customers and a sustainably profitable company. Likewise, it's children riding on the cycle wave gives us the benefit of children are safe. I'm now going to show you a bigger sub-strategy. I'm not going to talk through the details right now, but I will come back to it in a minute. I just want to show you what a bigger sub-strategy looks like. So here we go. So this is a sub-strategy on catchment management or catchment water management. It's a very, very high level strategy. You'll see it's got five projects, five results, three uses and four benefits. That's 17 boxes of information. And already that is starting to get too big and complex for many people. It's 17 boxes. I think most of us can handle something like this. You'll see the boxes are in those four columns, projects, results, uses, and benefits. They're also connected. So the projects connect through to results, results to uses and benefits. Some of the results don't get used. So orphan result number one, is a whole lot of information sitting in filing cabinets. That information from this box, Orphan Result 1, feeds down into the box to do with regulations. It guides the, the creation of regulations. It also feeds down into this box called resources. So that's all I want to show you at this stage. I'll come back and go through this slide in more detail in a few moments. In an open strategy, we have a hierarchy of these things called sub-strategies. And the next picture looks incredibly complex, but I'll talk you through it. An open strategy is something like this. At the top, we have these things called values and fundamental principles. So a value might be human life is sacred. The principle that arises from that is we will minimize net loss of human life and suffering. We might have another value called integrity. And the fundamental principle that arises from that is all decisions will pass the front page test. In other words, the decision has to survive going on the front page of a tabloid newspaper. And typically strategies have 10 or 15 fundamental principles and values. They're important, but not as important as you might think. And I'll show you why in a minute. Sitting under that, we have what we call an aspirational sub-strategy. And here it is. It's what we saw on the previous page. There's an aspirational sub-strategy on its own. Here it is within an open strategy. So we'll have one at this very high level. Typically we have five to 10 slightly more detailed strategies. We call those guidance sub-strategies. Then this nested under that, we have maybe 20 to 100 operational sub-strategies. And a key point is they are all in the same format. So everybody can understand them at whatever level and they can see how their strategy at an operational level fits into the, the higher level strategies. And that's essential in a large, complex strategic environment like after, a, after an earthquake. However, if you're going to create strategies, you've got to know that it's going to work. And so we have this concept called validating strategies, and there's three steps to it. Sorry, anybody could write a document, call it a strategy, but it's got to be validated. So how do we do that? So I'll go straight into that. The first step is, is it logical? Can you create your idea as a sub-strategy, as one of those diagrams I'm showing, I've showed you where the projects lead through to results, uses, and benefits? That doesn't mean it'll work. So the second step is, is there compelling evidence that it will work? And the evidence sits on the linkages between the projects and the results, the results and the uses, the uses and benefits. And the third step is, is it worth it? The value of the benefits, that's um, economic value, social value, cultural value, environmental value, must be greater than the cost of the projects plus the cost of the uses. So that's what we mean by validating the strategy. I'm now going to go quickly through a couple of examples, one on COVID-19 and one going back to the catchment management strategy. So if we look at values and fundamental principles for COVID-19, it might look something like this, human life sacred, the principle arising from that will minimize net loss of human life. A value, transparency, the principle, all meetings will be public, be widespread public consultation and so on. 
balance in all things. We will judge all decisions on how they impact on each other. So the value is a statement, it's like a belief. The fundamental principle describes the behavior that matches the value. So just having values isn't good enough. We need to say, what would that value look like if we were doing something about it? Sitting under the, that, we have the very, very high level statement about what are we trying to do about COVID-19? So can you just read that through? I'm sure these four boxes could be worded better. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what we try and do in open strategy. We try and create this one line project result use benefit to say, this is what we're trying to do. And some of the key messages here, if we go into the projects, we're trying to motivate large numbers of people to do something. So the project isn't about get more PPE equipment. That'd be one of the many projects, but the key thing we're trying to do with COVID-19 is to motivate and enable millions of people to do many, many things to minimize net human suffering. So we're trying to minimize the deaths from um, COVID-19. But in China, they're having few, fewer deaths from air pollution because the, the cities have been shut down. So we're actually gaining human lives. There's fewer road accidents. So we're getting fewer deaths on the road while we're shut down, even if we might have people dying from the virus. So I believe the strategy needs to look at the net human suffering and death, not just the, the deaths arising from, um, from COVID. So anyway, that's just a high level story that you could pull together on COVID-19. And if you were creating an open strategy, you would have layers of strategy sitting underneath that. Let's look at another example. This is catchment management, going back to that one. So we've got a value relating to Maori values about alpine water and lowland water. The principle that arises from that is don't mix alpine and lowland water. You'll see that the values, transparency and integrity are irrelevant to this one as well. And what we find is that just about all strategies have a very, very similar set of values and a very similar set of fundamental principles. So while the values and the fundamental principles are important, they are not the strategy. They don't actually tell you the things you're going to do. It's the sub-strategies that tell you the things you're going to do. So let's look at a very high level statement about managing water in a catchment, whether it's in a crisis or not, it might be after a major earthquake. Just have a skim through those statements. So again, the key thing around this is that we're trying to enable and motivate thousands of people. The strategy isn't about a territorial authority doing something, that might be part of the strategy. But we're trying to motivate a lot of people to do things. So that's why the projects are all about enabling and motivating people. With environment strategies, I always have two uses. There's the uses that people do, and there's the uses that the environment itself does. The environment is a key actor, it uses itself. Birds use the river for drinking, fish swim in the river. So if you're getting on to environmental strategies, we've got to have the environment as an actor as well. My next slide, I'm going back to that earlier slide on catchment management. I'm gonna talk you through it in a little bit more detail. So here it is. I want to draw your attention to project number five and uses one, two, and three. Those are the only actions that make any difference to water management. So project five, creating assets. So that might be building storage dams. It might be doing riparian planting. It might be planting your crops in a different way. So that is creating the water management asset. It might be planting trees. So that alters the water management. 
the uses, uh, that's where people are using water. So the first use is it might be farmers irrigating and they're making money out of it. A non-commercial use, use number two, people could be canoeing. They could be con collecting mahanga kai, which is food from water. And then the third use is nature is using water as well. And that generates, those three uses generate our four benefits, economic, cultural, social, and environmental. Project five and those three uses won't happen unless we achieve result number four. So have a look at that, just read that one through. So better water management will only happen if the people out in the field are actually enabled and motivated to run project five, create assets, and to use the water. So if we don't enable and motivate those people, we're wasting our time. Sadly, a lot of strategies start up at project number one and they go around collecting lots and lots of information and they write lots of reports and they come up with tables of targets and strategies and so on. But they completely miss what is required in result four. Result four is what the farmer needs. It's what the people on the ground need. So a key thing with an open strategy is to find what are the boxes in there that are absolutely crucial. Project five, use one, two, and three are the things that will make a difference out there. Result four is what will enable and motivate it. So all the earlier projects and results, the purpose of those is to get to result number four. Because once you've got result number four, everything else will follow. As I mentioned before, projects often produce a result that we call an orphan result. So project number one here is producing a whole lot of information sitting in a filing cabinet. That's great, it's an orphan result because the, the information is not actually available to everybody. So that information might feed down to improve regulations. Here we've got regulations that will feed down to resources. People, we need to get more resources together creating tools, for example, on how to manage water, and that's result number three. But all of the, those projects ultimately have to be disseminated to the end user, so we have enabled and motivated users. This dissemination project is seriously missing in an awful lot of strategies, unfortunately. And if you want to know where do strategies fail, they typically fail where I've drawn dotted lines. So they fail here, Dissemination doesn't work. They fail here. Projects aren't created because the stakeholders weren't sufficiently motivated. And they fail here. Users don't do what we expect to do because they weren't enabled and motivated. So if you're looking to improve a strategy, improve those linkages where the dotted lines are. So this is just the high level picture of everything we're gonna to do to manage a catchment. Let's now delve down a couple of levels, down to an operational level. Let's have a look at what a group of farmers might need to do. And in this, what I'm going to show you, I'm only going to show you one of, one of the boxes. It's that result number four, because it's a really crucial box. So here's an operational level sub-strategy. We could create similar strategies for fishermen, for a section of the river, species living in the river. And look at what's in this box number four. This is what the farmers need. They need farmer-friendly modelling tools, they need native trees and shrubs, they need fencing material, government grants, regulations, and all of these things. And they need to have those things and be motivated to do something about it. Can you see why that box is such a crucial box in this whole strategy? If we don't enable and motivate those people, nothing's gonna happen. What you will have noted here is that this sub-strategy is in the same format as the previous sub-strategy. And I'm gonna make quite a powerful claim here. I believe all strategies can use this standard format. The first set of projects about collecting information, a second set about regulation, a set about assembling resources, dissemination, and then create assets. That will lead to enabled and motivated stakeholders, uses and benefits. 
if we're going to have multi-stakeholder strategies with hundreds of stakeholders and multiple levels of strategies, a strategy for care workers, a strategy for hospital workers, a strategy for, for supermarket checkout operators, I believe we can represent all of those strategies in the same format. And if we do it in the same format, we can all understand each other's strategies. It's the simplest possible strategic format that we've been able to come up with the smallest amount of strategic information that has the highest value to the most people. I'm going to take this just slightly further. If we could create many, many sub-strategies using this format, I think we could actually create the, an international library of sub-strategies. So if we create COVID-19 sub-strategies in New Zealand at the national level, at regional levels, at hospitals, the care workers, for somebody in a high isolation bubble, for a sports club, for churches, taxis, and even a cruise ship. Wouldn't it be kind of neat if we could share those sub-strategies around the world? Other people around the world might pick up those sub-strategies, they might edit them for local conditions. That's great. But at least we'd have a basis of shared strategies. We could do the same with transport strategies, with water management strategies, with climate change strategies. We could share strategies in a form that we all understand. So I'd like to ask you a question. If we had such a strategy of international libraries, would you search it? I guess there's a pretty strong affirmation that people would uh, use such a thing. I must say that warms the autumn day down here in New Zealand. Um, time and my challenge is we're going to need input from thousands and thousands of people but look you've, you've given me an answer that will motivate me to try and take this to the next step thank you for that maybe this image is trying to join the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere i don't know but society is being reset at the moment in a major way i found that my, my son has got a couple of um, you know very very energetic young girls and he's often found it was really great if he could get them off to daycare. He's now found that when he's been locked in the house with them day after day, initially it was stressful, but they're actually really enjoying it now. Their whole mindset has been reset by this process. And as project managers, we have to allow our minds to be reset. Our environment is complex, unknown unknowns, but our actions and our strategies have to be simple. They have to be known knowns. If we're working with thousands of people, we've got to recognize that humans are, have cognitive limits. So use the smallest amount of strategic information as the highest value to the most stakeholders. No one can understand it all. So we have to tap into everybody's wisdom. We're all different, that's okay. There is no common set of priorities. We have to have priorities emerging all over the place in a very messy way, but somehow, pull it together in a, in a coordinated way. And that's what I believe open strategies can do. And please do things with us, not to us, for us, at us. Don't try and be the heroes. Don't try and be the top down managers of the crisis. Try and find ways of enabling and motivating as many people as possible to contribute. So if we come to open strategies, there's your answer to life and everything that's prub. I believe project management has got the power to heal countries after this crisis. You've got real power there to improve things economically, environmentally, socially, and culturally. We need to grab that challenge, but we've got to do it with a very, very open mind. We've got to listen. We've got to understand uses and benefits. We've got to enable and motivate a lot of other people, not just ourselves. And I'm sure none of you wants to create what we call an abandoned orphan result, an orphan result that nobody uses. But if you use a validated strategy approach, it will enable you to satisfy yourselves that your strategies and projects can be understood by everybody, that they're logical, that they will enable and motivate users to create benefits, and that they are worth it. So look, just one last minute message. Only users create benefits. It's a very inconvenient truth. We as project managers don't create benefits. We create results. People use them and the use creates the benefit. See why we have to enable and motivate people. We have to enable and motivate those uses. Um, finally, in terms of your responses, 
uh, a little bit of reflective practice. So we'd like you to tell us either what you've learned or what you will do differently as a result of attending this webinar. So this is, uh, this is all about event ROI, if you like. A couple of questions. For example, drinking clean water, the result is clean water, so you better manage the catchment, um, need projects to keep the water clean. So that might consist of a project to build a water treatment plant, or it might be regulations on how um, farmers can farm next to a river, so the river doesn't need treating, so it stays clean. And so in New Zealand, for example, um, there's regulations on what farmers can do on the land so that you don't get nitrate leaching into the water. So the uses people are able to drink clean um, groundwater and the benefit is they're healthy. We have other benefits where the farmers want to be um, economically sustainable. So their use of the water might be uh, irrigation to grow high value crops, which they can sell and obviously make money. So a result that they would need would be an irrigation system. They would need permits to um, abstract water from somewhere. And there might be a lot of disagreement about where they're allowed to take their water from. Um, you know, there's this desire to build more dams in New Zealand and a huge amount of resistance coming from communities. It's going to be interesting to see how that changes post COVID where um, I think there's a much greater awareness of how much farming is important to New Zealand. So I don't know if that gives an example, but um, usually I say, once you understand what the benefit, whether it's health or happiness, you can come back and say, well, in order to be that healthy, um, you know, you need to be doing these things. Um, I, I'll give you a slightly amusing story. I, I did a um, course for some people on the West Coast and the woman came to me the next day and said, my husband wants to buy a fishing rod. And I said, he, you know, he couldn't have one until he burped it. So what's the benefits that would arise from a new fishing rod? You know, was he going to have more fish? Was he, you know, all these things. And, and he just couldn't come up with it because the project was buy a fishing rod, result you've got one, the use is he's fishing, what's the benefit? There weren't going to be any more fish. And it took him about three days. And he said that the benefit was he would feel really good using a new fishing rod. So she said, well, go and buy it. So the benefit was a feel good factor. And that in their family situation was entirely legitimate. It drove the project to say, go and buy it. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and Adrian asks an existential question for all of us, really, which is uh, how do we get project managers and project management to, to be active at the C-suite level, which is, is really what PRUB needs? So how do we connect project managers and strategy? I guess that uh, more and more people at the C-suite level, when we're talking about these large complex strategies, are going to recognise that we have to enable and motivate you know, masses and masses of people. And I think it took a while after the Canterbury earthquakes, we had various people moved in and tried to be heroes. They tried to, in fact, the, the city council came up with a, um, a district plan for uh, the eastern suburbs, cost them half a million, and it was a complete waste of money because nobody in the eastern suburbs wanted or, or could afford it. So unfortunately, after a crisis, we have to go through that little period where the heroes fail, and then they start listening to the end users. They start listening to um, the project managers who are, are able to convey that grassroots information up to the C-suite. Um, I actually have slightly more faith in the C-suite. Um, I, I think there's a lot of people out there listening at the moment and learning very, very fast. Just the importance of frontline workers at the moment is just getting so much airtime. I don't think anybody could ignore that anymore. So I, it's an indirect answer to the question. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, and I have uh, uh, one last question here, which is actually in, in two parts. Um, another big question. And, um, and John asks, how do I mobilize and continue to deliver projects for the world benefit while coming out of COVID? And the second part of the question is, is how do I strategize the mobilization in a, a vacuum of forward information? So uh, how do I mobilize and continue to deliver projects 
in in a world well, while we're coming out of COVID and how do I do that in the context of a situation where we have really very little information, forward information on what's going to happen when? I guess my answer would be very similar to the apple on the blossom. Um, I don't know. And that is the reality of the post-crisis situation. Do we know whether shutdown is really going to work? And New Zealand is aiming to eliminate the virus. Is that the right thing to do? We don't know. And I think the key issue here is to experiment, experiment, read, learn what other people are doing. There, I don't think there is any right answer because we're all under different shutdown conditions. It looks as if our level of shutdown, which is level four at the moment, may change to level three uh, next week. And that will open up more opportunities for project managers to, to get out there and operate. So, John, I think your question hits the nail on the head that we all have to learn from each other, speak to other project managers. I tried this, it didn't work. What did you do? Yeah, I tried that and it worked. Okay, let's learn from that. It's a very different environment from following a textbook on project management. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Cheers.